Hi, and thanks for clicking. As you can see from the title, today I'll be continuing my overview of the Legionary kit by looking at the small dagger known as the Pugio. I hope you enjoy. So, what does a Pugio look like? Well, just so happen to have one here. They're not exactly the most uh, commanding in terms of attention-seeking weapons you'll find. Normally when you see a Legionary at reenactment or, or what such, you've got the shield, you've got the Gladius, you've got the Pelum, you've got all the other stuff going on. But this is worn on the left hip by some Legionaries, not all as we'll see later on, and it complemented the Gladius incredibly well. I, we'll look at the Gladius in another vlog, I hope. Well, we will do, trust me. First, let's start with the name, Pugio. Though it sounds quite comical, it's actually quite a malicious word. Pungo means to sting or pierce. And when I first found out about this, I immediately thought of the blade in The Hobbit, which could glow blue when the enemies were around. I think it's orcs or goblins. Anyway, I'm sure someone will tell me. We don't know if the Pugio ever glowed blue. It doesn't seem to have featured much in any literature. So uh, we'll just have to leave that one as a maybe. But it's interesting that Tolkien had that stem word for it as well. And knowing that he was a bit of a linguist, perhaps, just perhaps, um, he was a bit of a fan, a secret fan. But look at the blade. This isn't something you might use for whittling while set around camp. Romans already had utility knives. No, I would say that if you're wielding this, you are certainly not in a dull or boring situation. Like most of the Roman kit, it wasn't uniquely Roman. Rather, it had been introduced to Rome and recognised for its effectiveness. We'll get to how and why, but first we'll start with where and when. During the Second Punic War, in the latter part of the 3rd century BC, Polybius gives a good description of the Roman infantry and its equipment. The Pugio is omitted, yet it was probably there, albeit being used against the Romans by the Iberians fighting for Hannibal. Two authors, Casprini and Saliola, have written a book about the Pugio, which is very interesting, I'll put a link to it below. They argue that the first finds of these occurred in 130 to 100 BC in Numantia, which is northern Spain. It's likely that the Romans were coming up against local tribes, Celto-Iberians and Iberian troops, who were very well trained at close quarter combat, using daggers and shorter swords than perhaps the Romans had ever been used to. So when the Romans took these on board, it's likely they took them as a response to an increasing threat. And they probably developed their close quarter fighting skills even more as a result. This was Rome being classic Rome. It was responding and applying what it had seen to its own army. Pausing briefly, it's worth considering the when in all of this. At this point in Roman military history, Gaius Marius, who really developed the entire Roman military, was serving in Spain and involved in the Numantine Wars. It's a chance that he came across this weapon in its use against him, and it might have been one of the things that he brought in when he reformed the army himself. But, as Casprini and Saliole argue, the Pugio didn't seem to be a sidearm given to all. It wasn't standard equipment. In the Republican period, the finds are limited to Spain, whereas by the 1st century AD, they're normally found in Gaul, Britain, the Rhine and the Danube. Southern Europe, North Africa, what we call the Middle East, very few if any finds. Certainly nothing to suggest that the Pugio was being issued there as standard equipment. The obvious question, of course, is why? The Romans were by no means a wasteful bunch, so the chances are they weren't issued out in these places because the opponents the Romans were facing there weren't really getting that close to them and they didn't need that extra layer of close quarter combat, hand-to-hand -hand fighting. I've got two fantastic and glamorous assistants who I'll introduce you right now. One is the Gladius itself and we've got the Pugio. And you can see, if you can, hopefully, the level of reach the Gladius has over the Pugio. And of course, that's not a bad thing. The Gladius, and I'll do this in a vlog later on at some point, fantastic weapon, brilliant weapon. I've got no qualms with it, but at very, very tight, cramped conditions, uh, perhaps around corners if people are coming over walls at you, not always easy to maneuver. It's quite heavy. Remember, this blade isn't the lightest of things to move around. Pugio, on the other hand, very good weapon up close. Leaf blade means that it's going to do a lot of damage going in and a lot of damage coming out. The ones on the on the coin celebrate Caesar's assassination are in fact sort of triangular. So there were variations and we expect that. We can only standardise as much as could be done in the ancient world. However, if you're in a defensive situation, again, you're not going to go charging after someone with this and they're coming at you, your gladius perhaps isn't available or you realise that you haven't got quite the space to get in there and use it. This is an absolutely perfect backup weapon. The Pugio's greatest moment was its representation on a coin, which doesn't sound exactly the biggest thing, except this coin was the one minted by the Republicans after the assassination of Caesar. 
Uh, it features on the coin because it would have been the weapon that Brutus and co would have used to stab Caesar to death. So think about that. In the space of perhaps less than 100 years, it's gone from being a weapon used against the Romans to one adopted by the, by the Romans, and then more or less the absolute representation of the Republic, that quintessential Roman thing, the dream of the re-establishment of the Republic. Not bad for really such a small thing with a bit of a funny sounding name.